and welcome to our brand new podcast series, Decade of Excellence, Reimagining Human Health. Through this series, we'll be celebrating the 10th anniversary of our bioengineering department here at the University of Texas at Dallas. My name is Shalini Prasad, and I am the department head for the bioengineering department. Thank you all for joining us on this podcast. My guest today is Dr. Hubert Zajek, who has an MD and an MBA. He is the CEO, co-founder, and partner at Health Wildcatters, which is a healthcare seed accelerator here in Dallas. And they have raised significant seed funds and have invested in about 77 early stage healthcare companies. So with him today, we explore the exciting entrepreneurship landscape, which is available for biomedical engineering students graduate. And with that, let me get started. Welcome, Hubert, to this program. I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you into starting Health Wildcatters? Thank you, Shalini, and good to be on your show. So thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so uh, how many hours do you have? <laughs> it's a long story, but the, the short version is that I went to medical school in Austria, where I'm from, and arrived here in the United States to start a postdoctoral fellowship in, uh, in nephrology, so kidney research. And I ended up staying in, in basic science research for 10 years. We had some NIH funding, joined the faculty at UT Southwestern here in Dallas. And uh, along the way, I just kind of had an interest in business, but I didn't quite know how to go about learning more about that. And so I ultimately uh, made the most expensive decision I could have made, and that is (laughs) acquire an MBA, which I did in evenings. um, And I did that at SMU. It's actually interesting because it was between SMU and UTD for me to uh, go to the professional program. You know, I'm embarrassed to say that the decision was largely at the time based on logistics because I had a young family and uh, SMU was literally on the way home. But uh, in any case, um, both institutions have great education and I enjoyed a fantastic education at SMU and really got my bearing. So it really did accomplish what I set out to do and that is to learn more about business, to figure out where that interest of business and healthcare can find a a fruitful intersection. I had started volunteering at a local incubator in Frisco called North Texas Enterprise Center for Medical Technology. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, but at the time it was new and budding and um, I'd volunteered. And then uh, as luck will have it, joined the incubator as the the second person to to help run it. Uh, Got to do a lot of things there. And so really this was the big transition, right? From academia into a kind of a transitional position of healthcare and and business. Learned a lot there, got to meet a lot of startups, uh, did all sorts of things, uh, ran a big investment conference that we started, very entrepreneurial venture uh, with a great colleague of mine, Larry Cal- Kelton. And then seven years ago, started Health Wildcatters together with three other people. Now fast forward seven years, there's five of us, five partners, all of us are have deep expertise in healthcare. Three of us are actually physicians by training. Only one of us is still practicing, but all five of us are deep in healthcare and business. And so all of us are also angel investors and interested in in angel investments. So that's kind of the circuitous story of how I got there. I think the the take home for, for anyone that's listening that's like interested in a career transition or exploring other things is to Go to meetings that are uh, of organizations in that field. There is many of those in Dallas, obviously anywhere in the world, wherever you are. But you got to get out of your comfort zone, meet some people there. You're going to be uncomfortable at the beginning doing that. And um, But if you can find your groove, things will happen. And so both my career transitions were um, precipitated by people I had met and networked with in the prior years. So that's, to me, uh, the most important thing I can say about the the journey of getting to where I am today. That's really fascinating, especially because you're giving us all the courage to think about training all through our lives, you know, and exploring new opportunities. 
You are the 2020 Dennis K. Stone Award winner, and you are the innovation advocate for the year. And that's really exciting for us, you know. And so can you tell us a little bit about what that means to you and your vision for this Texas Health Wildcatters, right? So what's your vision for that, the accelerator itself? I guess if you do something long enough and a few people like you, then eventually uh, somebody will give you a nice award. And so I've, I'm, I'm very, very excited about having gotten the Dennis K. Stone Award. I actually knew Dennis Stone. He's, he's not alive anymore. Uh, he's a tremendous uh, person here in our community. And um, and so it was, it was fun to get the award. But what I said when I received the award is the following, and that is, when people like me get something like this, this is not because of the things we ourselves do, it's because of the things we do together with other people or in collaboration with other people. And if enough people think that way, we can accomplish a lot in this community or any community, wherever you are. So I'm blessed in that regard that I've been in positions where uh, the last couple uh, that I was in, where I had the great fortune to meet a lot of people and connect a lot of people. And so that's what this award is for, doing that um, selfishly. On, on health wildcatters, I have to lean on my, specifically on my partner, Carl Soderstrom, who really had a desire to start a healthcare accelerator. And uh, he knew me and I knew him and I knew his partner. And I don't know, there was enough of us that knew each other that when the time was right and they were looking at starting this, I uh, happen to fit into just the right position to help them launch it. And so the vision there was the the deficiency that Carl and Clay saw was they they met a lot of startups and as investors, they also had a lot of experience, but um, they were not in a position to help every single startup that approached them. And sometimes they saw a startup they might like but it was too early for them to invest. And here, here is the conundrum. You have a startup that needs help and money, but the investor then says, well, I can give you the money once you have these things figured out. And then the startup will say, well, but I need help figuring them out. And the investor will say, well, once you figure it out, I'll give you the money. So it becomes this catch 22, right? If you had the money, you can figure them out. Or if you had the assistance, you could figure them out and then get the money. In all instances, you will need some help and of course, an, a professional investor cannot just quit his or her job and, and, and start helping everyone as much as they would like to. But they thought, man, we really like some of these startups. If we could only dedicate some time with them when they're young, we, I bet we could help them a lot. And I bet some of we might end up investing ourselves. So that was behind Health Walk Headers. And of course, they, they quickly discovered that accelerators are around, healthcare accelerators were still pretty young. Uh, but accelerators were around in the country, and they decided that that would be something they could model um, health wildcatters after. And so that's where I came into the picture as well and obviously started building it from scratch. The first thing we had to do is raise a raise million dollars for something that is completely unproven and, uh, and then find startups to join us, uh, join us, an accelerator that had zero track record. So it wasn't, it wasn't exactly... Uh, a given that uh, that we would be successful, but I can I can be happily report now that we have now accelerated 77 uh, healthcare startups from 28 states and three countries. Uh, this program this year was completely virtual. We have raised over a hundred million dollars. We celebrated our first Nasdaq IPO this year of one of our portfolio companies. We're very very blessed with many, many great things that we've been allowed to be a part of, and also some of which we've been allowed to create for the betterment of our uh, region and um, the health innovation community as a, as, a, as a larger entity. That's really exciting to know that such a vibrant uh, healthcare innovation community that we have here in the DFW area. So perhaps you could speak a little bit more to that. How is the biomedical startup field like here in the DFW area? We generally hear about the coasts being the places where this is very prevalent. So how is it here at DFW? And how are the companies that come to your Health Wildcatters Accelerator able to leverage DFW or its resources to you know, better themselves and progress? Well, first of all, our startups actually come from a very, very amount of geographic backgrounds. And funny enough, that doesn't even tell the whole story. 
for instance, one of our startups that was in this program, I refer to them as a Boston-based startup. But this Boston-based startup happens to be led by a entrepreneur who currently lives in Boston. However, he's a Canadian who grew up in Korea, and his partner is a Canadian who still lives in Canada. So very often you, you get into these situations and where is the startup from? And so the world is really flattening is I guess what I'm trying to say. This year we really had to address that because the, the, the nine startups that came to us are from six different time zones, Israel, uh, Spain, and then all four time zones of the United States. And now you might ask, well, what does the accelerator do and how is any of this still Dallas-based? And the answer is that our investors are mostly Dallas-based. Concentric circles around Dallas and North Texas is what you would envision when you look at the investors. Uh, the same is true of all the resources and all the sponsors. And so it's still our home base. But however, uh, this home base is helping startups that are now being helped remotely in other places. Still, they will have an ever closer connection to our region. So for startups that are here in Dallas already, and don't take this wrong, there are a, a bunch of them here also. And we do have a whole bunch of them in our portfolio, of course, uh, that are from the region originally. For those startups, it's it's gotten, I would say, better and better over the last uh, at least 10, 20 years. And the, the, the thing is, we're, you know, we will be known for oil, gas, real estate, and banking, and some of the more uh, down-to-earth trades, but technology is now emerging as a top um, employer here. We were just this week called out as the number two uh, place for tech uh, for tech talent after Austin, and that is nationwide. So Austin ranks first, Dallas ranks second in the nation for uh, technology, talent, and opportunity. So we're getting known for other things as well. And healthcare is very close behind. Healthcare in Dallas is roughly 20% of GDP. That is a large chunk. That is a lot of GDP. And it just means that when you, you multiply the, lar the size of the DFW region as the fourth largest, largest metro area in the United States, with 20% uh, of it being healthcare related, that you end up with a ton of innovation a ton of opportunity and such critical mass that it's really not possible to ignore it anymore. So there's a, a lot of innovation happening, a lot of support for it. There are a lot of different varied groups that have popped up even over the last few years uh, that are playing a role in, in furthering health innovation and uh, also relevant resources and potential partners moving to the region. For instance, McKesson, which is a Fortune 10, one of the 10th largest publicly traded companies moved to Dallas in the last couple of years. And those things matter. So um, again, if you looked at the top uh, 10 Fortune 500 companies, three of them are healthcare. And uh, so, so you kind of see something merging together here that gets certainly very interesting and I think creates a, a very conducive environment for both furthering the progress of health innovation and also investing in it. That's really exciting to hear that there are so many opportunities that are sprouting in our very own backyard. So then let me ask you, when I say UTD bioengineering, what comes to your mind? If this is a pop quiz, I would say excellence, diligence, quality. Uh, those are the top three things that would pop into my head. I've had many, many interactions with UTD in general. I've always come away, I've spoken to, for instance, to pre-med club there, or um, entrepreneurship related clubs and an investment group that meets their IITAN, the business school. So just what, whenever I'm up at the campus, I, I see uh, just superb and excellent professors and students. And so that's number one. I haven't had as many interactions with the biomedical engineering group, and you know, we're both working on changing that. Those are the top three things that pop to my head. I, I, would, I would say second to none, and I'm very excited about uh, your leadership there and, and UTD uh, flying the banner uh, so forcefully in our region with uh, biomedical engineering. You're absolutely right. The, uh, the idea here is to partner and go into new dimensions. So let me ask you in the context of where we are currently with the pandemic and the amount of stress that bioengineering graduates, not just them, but graduates in general have, 
what are the things that they need to perhaps keep in mind as they start taking their first steps for their career, whether it is in entrepreneurship or whether it is in other job aligned into this area? So your piece of advice. Since you referred to the Dennis K. Stone Award earlier, I was uh, allowed to say a few words at that occasion. And what I wanted to show was there are so many different opportunities in our region that the first thing to do is to, to start putting your feelers out and connecting with people. So having come from research myself, you know, I was, yes, I was trained as a physician, but I spent 10 years in research and just at the bench with other PhD, mostly PhDs, I was kind of the odd man out. And, um, you know, one of the things that did not come naturally to most of us was being outgoing or meeting other people or going out of your comfort zone or what often would be referred to as networking in general. And the first time when I was experiencing that urge, that interest in business, the first group that I attended meetings of was a group called BioDFW. It doesn't exist anymore. But they had monthly breakfasts that I could attend before the, you know, before I went to the lab uh, on campus at UT Southwestern. So it was convenient. I could go to work early, attend the meeting, learn something about a startup or a uh, some sort of engineering or a new invention or something uh, business related, and then go to the lab thereafter. But what most people will not really know, but I think a lot of students will uh, you know, feel the same ways. When you first walk into a room of people that are all business people and you're not a business person because I was not one, you know, you it's a bit in intimidating. You you don't know what to talk about. You don't know the subjects. You don't have reference points. You don't know a single person in the room. And that's a very difficult thing to to do. What I challenge everyone is to go out there and do that. And here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is uh, if you're really, if you're really shy, like, like I was, um, well, there are not a lot of in-person meetings this moment, so you might not have to go through that pain or agony. Uh, the bad news of course is there are not many opportunities to meet people in person. And I still think you connect best that way. The advantage here is that you can attend meetings through zoom or remotely and maybe ease yourself into this a little bit, uh, but I challenge you to take participate in one of the breakout sessions and meet somebody random. Meet somebody completely random. Don't put any qualifiers on it. Don't say it has to be a professor. Don't say it has to be a business person. Don't say it doesn't matter. Keep a completely open mind and and let that surprise you. In, on balance, you will you'll get to know some really cool people, and I did, and um, and you'll be surprised how many people would like to help you if. They know you and understand how how they could help. Great advice, you know, putting ourselves out there and really not getting judgmental. And I think that's very important. It's true for anything we do in life. Uh, so the last question, you know, your parting thoughts on words of wisdom for people who are innovators, who want to be entrepreneurs. What is it that we sh they should be thinking about? Well, I think the most important thing about entrepreneurship is to actually do it. I mean, I have a, a little index card around with me when I was in research and I wrote down like ideas I had. And you know, the daunting thing was they were never, the ideas I had were actually not cell biology or nephrology ideas. They were like consumer articles or new innovations that had to do with cars and stuff like that. So it was, it was really a little distressing that the things that I came up with were just things that anybody could have come up with, but I, I did not execute on, on any of them. Uh, not, not, not that I regret that, but the difference between having an idea and executing is being an entrepreneur. Uh, anyone can come up with things and write them down on a piece of paper. Very few people can actually make something out of it, a product or a company. So the first step that you're going to have to do is and I think one of the best things you could do is do this with other people is to to pick something and then go after it. In other words, uh, I'm not one of those geniuses that can just sit in his office and come up with things and then do them all by himself without feedback. I need other people to bounce ideas off of or at least listen to me and give me feedback. And that helps me tremendously. So find a, a person or two that you like that you like to hang out with and start talking about ideas and things you might be able to do. And then together, maybe find somebody that's on the business side that can help you 
uh, give you some advice, some pointers. Participate in a business plan competition. Uh, I did that when I was in business school. Start student club at, at the university. I, I, uh, I ran the healthcare and biotechnology club and I was the only, the only non-full-time MBA that ran a student club. And also I was in my thirties. So I was by far the out man now. Don't let that get you. Do, do those things and I think you're going to find that the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship is going to be right there at the action and doing level. And that is required if you want to move the ball forward. So that to me is, is the best thing. On the innovation side alone, again, bouncing ideas off of others, I think is the best thing you can do. Uh, as a student, you've got an amazing opportunity to approach almost anyone because you call someone and say, I'm a student in biomedical engineering. Would it be possible to talk for 15 minutes about a certain topic? Most people will say, sure, let me find you a time slot. And, and I do these things all the time as well. Now, obviously, I have to be limits on that. I, <laughs> I do have a, a day job. But, but anyway, I, I think that to me is the most important thing you can do is find others, talk about it, get out of your comfort zone, and then execution, even starting it is the first step. I think don't ever be shy. I'm an immigrant. And of course, I knew the language, but you know, I had a funny accent too, and I still have a little bit of an accent. But uh, people are very embracing of, of any student that has a desire to, to learn something. And I think that goes for anyone. You don't have to be a student. Uh, and so I, I believe that's, that's your ace in the hole. That's, that's your, your, uh, the card you should play. And, and, and I bet we're going to see uh, a lot of cool innovation uh, out of uh, UTD's biomedical engineering program. Those are great words. That's exciting, right? So I think the coolest thing that I got out of is the intersection between innovation and entrepreneurship is action, right? So we got to act, you know, and I really thank you for that thought. So thank you very much for this really enjoyable chat, Hubert. I mean, you've given us so much to think about, and I'm sure our graduates would uh, enjoy listening to this because most of them have an entrepreneurship vision within them. So thank you for your time. Thank you, it was my pleasure.